Hello there, and you're very welcome along to the launch of 1922 to 2022, A Century of Change. My name is Justin McCarthy. I'm a broadcaster with RTE, and I'm very pleased to be here in the RDS to take part in the RDS Library Speaker Series and to help launch this oral history collection. This is part two of a major history project recorded by Irish Life and Lore and spearheaded by Morris and Jane O'Keefe. And it is a project which involves hundreds of hours of recordings. And when it is completed, it will involve over 300 interviews documenting the changes that have taken place in Irish life over the past 100 years in the areas of business, science, education, the arts, sport, and many, many more. Now, anybody who's lived through the last uh, couple of months will know how quickly things can change and I suppose how um, rapidly people have to adapt. And under normal circumstances, we would be sitting here in a room together uh, celebrating the launch of this project and chatting about it uh, and talking to each other and sharing our stories. But uh, these, as we know, are not normal times and the launch today has to be done quite differently. And that's why we're speaking to you online rather than in person. And um, I think, though, those changes only serve as a reminder uh, to all of us that nothing stays the same and that everything does change. And that is, in essence, what this project is all about as well because Ireland has changed dramatically in the past 100 years. The country has evolved from being a place which was defined by conflict, by um, religious dominance, by conservatism, uh, to become a much more open and progressive country. And the story of that change is told in this project. It is told in what I think is the most powerful way possible, and that is through the voices of the people who've experienced that change. Uh, in a moment, we'll hear some of the recordings from this project, and Morris will tell us uh, more about his plans for the future. But I just wanted to say a few words about Morris and the work that he does, because I think the work that Morris does does us all a great service. As Martin Luther King said, we're not the makers of history, but we are made by history, and it's very important that we know uh, where we've come from so that we know the direction that we're traveling in. And I know um, when I met you, Morris, um, a couple of years ago, I was working on Morning Ireland, and I think um, we collaborated together to try and get a number of your recordings uh, broadcast on the radio. And one of your great skills, Morris, I think, is um, apart from being very persistent, <laughs> is your ability uh, to get people to talk to you and to tell you their stories. And I think your interview uh, technique is very subtle and it comes across very well in these, the interviews for, the, for this collection. Um, I, I think, you know, a lot of current affairs interviewers, like myself, uh, can be accused sometimes of trying to crack a nut with a sledgehammer. Um, your, your technique is, is, is more subtle than that. I think you're more like a sculptor. You're trying to chisel out the story and uh, that really comes across. Uh, in the, when the interviews are concluded. Uh, the subject is there, is revealed uh, for, for people to, to see through those audio recordings. And um, I think that style helps mm. to bring the, the, the stories out. Um, so, Morris, let's talk maybe about the, the project itself. Uh, this is part two of uh, the series 1922 to 2022. Can you tell me how did the idea first come about? Well, yes, it was. It all started um, at the end of 2018. Uh, I had just finished work in the north of Ireland. Uh, I worked uh, in both Fermanagh, Cavan, straggling the border, recording people's stories relating to the troubles, the 30 years of violence there, and recording people from both sides. So I finished that project. Uh, it took a year and a half to put it together, but when I finished at the end of uh, 2018, in beginning of 2019. I, I thought about the next project should really be something that has to do with what's going to happen in, in uh, 2022, because in 2022, we're going to be commemorating and celebrating uh, the foundation of our state. And you know, now was the time to get stuck in and uh, network and go around and find people who were, in their lives, instrumental in, in, in the country. Because these are the people that I felt should be listened to. 
and, and have their, their testimonies um, on record. And it, it is a hugely broad project when you sit down to, uh, to, to decide to do something like this. But it, it really is individual stories that tell the entirety of the story of the formation of a, of a nation like that, isn't it? It is. It, uh, <laughs> when you look at it from the outside, you think, oh my God, how am I going to do this? But I think, you know, if, if you do it systematically, break it down into to categories, and you're dealing with all the different categories, but then you find the people uh, who, in their lives, say, are working under the radar, not necessarily the, uh, the celebrities or the people who you always see, uh, but try and find the people who, you know, had gave a lot in their lives to, in, in their career, to the way the country was formed. I'm sure you didn't anticipate um, doing a project like this in the middle of a pandemic. How have the last few months been? I mean, what difficulties has there been for you in trying to conduct interviews in, in circumstances where people are being asked to stay apart? Yeah, well, you see, we had such a good run, really, uh, for the first project, you know, 133 people were interviewed for that. So I started January the 2nd, part two, uh, and uh, we had uh, uh, a lot of work in January, February, uh, and the beginning of March, with, with the help of, of funding uh, coming from a private source. But these were the good days. You know, we, we really had the experience of the, the previous year. So we had the contacts, we had the people to go to, and we, we recorded quite a bit. But then, uh, in, in March, I'm afraid it was lockdown, and, and we were just editing the work that we did, and, um, and we just waited. We waited for... Uh, to get back on the road again in the end of June, beginning of July, and we worked um, endlessly to, to, to get this project finished. And I know it's important to have those stories told to you in person uh, rather than down a Skype line or over a Zoom call or, or, or yeah. anything like that. You mentioned funding there, Morris. I know that um, you don't get any government funding for the work that you do, but your work is available through the, the, the library system for people to access if they, if they want to. But how difficult is it to get funding to keep this project going? Well, we, we depend on people's generosity uh, and we, uh, a lot of people see our work as, as beneficial. Um, they want to give something back to the, the state, really, by having something that's, that will be there today and uh, for, forever. Like, it, it's... Um, it's a source, and the, the, the longer, um, you know, if I record this now, I think in 20 years' time, 30 years' time, I think this project is going to be seen as, as an extremely valuable project. And um, Yes, who, who, who do you think will, will, will find value in this project? I mean, when you record stories like this, I think stories like this, they, they grow in value over time because, you know, the more time that has elapsed, future generations are going to want to find out more about the past. And listening to recordings like this is going to help them understand what the past was like. Um, uh, but but how, how would you see a project like this being of value in the future? Well, I, I see it of value today as well as the future because um, it, it's a primary source. It's a source of material where anybody doing research uh, uh, in a particular uh, category, whether it's uh, uh, in business or uh, whether it's in, in science or whatever uh, area, uh, you can always look into Irish life and lore. And you can learn, I think, from, from what people, the way they live their lives, the way they, their own personal experiences in, in their career, how, what mistakes they made, what challenges were ahead of them, and, and how, how they succeeded back in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And, and then they can bring that forward, because unless we look into the past and see exactly uh, what happened, can we go forward? You know, 
so in, in the early part of the 1920s, Morris, we know the country was emerging from, from war, from civil war and, and uh, war of independence as well. Um, and then you track forward through the, the 30s, 40s, 50s, into the, the 80s and 90s and so on. Um, yeah. From your uh, experience, from the interviews that you've done, what do you think was the greatest period of change in Irish life in the past uh, 100 years? Oh, uh, there's changes in, in uh, all aspects of Irish life. Uh, there are changes in the way uh, business is done, changes in the way ar uh, agriculture, uh, farming practices, how they've changed, the way um, uh, communication, the way we communicate with each other. Uh, it's, it's extraordinary. You know, we've come really... In the last 50 years, we've come so far now. And to capture that as it unfolded was really exciting. Let's have a listen now to some of the, um, the audio that you did record. And we'll start with the area of agriculture. I suppose one of the biggest areas of, of transformation, as you yeah. mentioned, over the last 100 years, was in the sector of agriculture. And the way farming is done today is vastly, vastly different yeah. from the way it was done in the past. Um, let's have a listen now, and we'll talk about it afterwards, to uh, Patrick Nagel, who was talking about farming in the Burren. OK. When I think back, we didn't understand it as young lads. We would see this. My father got to the fair and later got to the master and bring home money. And my mother put the money away to make sure the rates were paid. And she put the money in under the, under the mattress. There was that, no bank. There was no bank. But that was to make sure that whoever came to collect the rates, that the money was there for them. Yeah. So it was, it was a very primitive, when I look back at it, it was a fabulous, it was fabulous living in it at that time. But for our parents, it was an awful struggle. And was it, was it pride that they didn't want to be short money to pay those, those rates, you know, at the time? I mean, was it essential? Oh, it, was, it was essential. Well, if you didn't, the, the Clare County Council at the time would bring you to court hmm. for not paying your rates. And it was a must. You had to. It's, it, to be honest about it, it's like paying tax today. You, you have it. Or you paid it, or you you went to the bank if you were able and you borrowed it, and there was desperate struggles for property. Lots of properties were lost because they couldn't afford to pay either the rent or the rate. There was two there was two demands. There was a rent on the property where people where people rented property from other people, and you had to pay the rent and the rate. I see. And did you find, uh, again in your father's time, uh, that the bailiffs were very active? Oh, they were. They were. And they were hated. That clip, uh, Morris, it shows, I suppose, what a tough mm. life it was farming uh, yeah. in the west of Ireland. Um, uh, I mean, talk about that clip to me, the, the, um, uh, what Patrick Nagel is talking about there. The yeah. difficulty, in, I suppose, in, in making sure... Number one, that you're trying to uh, farm the land properly, but secondly, um, the, the difficulties in, in, in paying your way. Yes, um, I met um, Patrick Nagel in uh, Kerr Finn in um, uh, County Clare. Um, I found him passionate, really, and it comes true in, in, in the interview uh, with him. And uh, the amount of um, information I gathered from that one interview, but here he's talking about uh, five generations of his family farmed the burn. Now, to farm, to have a farm on the burn alone uh, was a huge uh, task because you had to move your cattle uh, from, you know, to lower land in, 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 in the summertime and then back up in, into, in, into the burn for the winter grazing. But it, it was fascinating to listen to him and, and to hear how, how difficult it was for his parents and his grandparents to survive on the land. Things started to get more easier in his um, uh, farming years, but in his childhood he remembers the bailiff uh, coming to the door looking for the, 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 the rates. And if you didn't have them, you know, 
uh, it was the end of the road for you. When we think of agriculture in this country, I suppose the ploughing championships, uh, of course, come to mind for us. And um, you spoke to John O'Leary about the World Ploughing Championships uh, when they came to Killarney in, I think it was the 1950s. Was it 1956, I think? Um, let's have a listen now to, to what he told you. OK. And on that day, was there a big crowd? Was it? it was packed. It was packed. Yeah. The army was there controlling the crowd. The army. The World Plough Match in Killarney won't ever again happen because they have to get nearly half a count in order all the World Plough Match. But uh, it was great. It was great. That was great. That was the first day they ploughed doubles, and the second day they ploughed the band. And the third day, the night, they were the judging day. Yeah. So, was, but there was a parade in Killarney the first day, going back to it. And they were all the count, there was, I don't know how many, count it, no, but just there must be Germany and Holland and Belgium, and they all from the representative, England and Wales and all that. And there was a Republican feeling was kind of high at the time. But before the parade stopped and Mark British stood up and he said, I'm not playing on the British flag. I'm not ploughing under the British flag. Imagine. They said, what are you going to do? So he said, one flag or no flag. The other flag or no flag. Yeah. And that's what they had to do. There was one flag, the other flag. And the rest of the flags were in Florida at the Killarney Plymouth. One flag or no flag, Morris. Why, why yeah. was the British flag flying that time? Well, I'll tell you, uh, it, it, again, uh, I have to talk about uh, John O'Leary uh, in his 90s and, and such, a, uh, such an interesting man. You know, his farming was bordering on where the plough championships were held in 1954. But at that time, um, we were not that far removed from the War of Independence. So... You know, you still had Republican feelings were running high, as he said. So um, when they saw the Union Jack flying, I mean, they just they didn't want it. Mm. Uh, this uh, Mr. Murphy from uh, Wexford, who was uh, competing for, for Ireland, and he said, no, I'm not going to participate in this if Ireland is, if, if that flag is flying. So the, the, the committee had to come to a decision to take down all the flags and just leave the Irish flag flying. We, we know, of course, that the ploughing championships themselves then, uh, these were the world ploughing championships, but the yeah. national ploughing championships have really been gone from strength to strength and I suppose have been um, uh, sim you know, emblematic of, of uh, or a centrepiece for the agricultural community right across the country uh, since then as well, haven't they? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, if you were to hold uh, the World Championships today in Ireland, the, the plowing, you could, it would take up so much uh, ground and, and space. So it was, it was great for Killarney, mm. and it was lovely to capture his memories uh, in, uh, at that time and remember exactly all, you know, what happened. We heard earlier about farmers in the Burren hiding money under the bed because there were yeah. no banks uh, at the time, or certainly... Um, the people who were doing that were, were not customers of banks. Um, uh, but you, you have also taken a look at the evolution of the banking industry in Ireland, which of course was so important mm. as a foundation for a lot of the, the economic developments which took place later on. Um, it, you, you interviewed Mark Healy Hutchinson. Tell me about that interview. Yeah. Uh, it, it, was, it was a very interesting interview to do because um, under business and finance I wanted to try and get somebody who was uh, up there at the top uh, in the 19... Uh, 80s. 80s, mm. yes, yeah, 70s into the 80s. So, yeah. uh, and Mark was uh, Chief Executive of Bank of Ireland around that time. He was, yeah, but he, he had been uh, uh, managing director of Guinness's Ireland before he, he got that appointment. So he knew the minute he went into the bank um, that th th there had to be changes. It was too conservative. 
and you'll hear him now in a minute, because you know, he's talking about what the bank had to do at the time to try and create more business. Let's have a listen to that clip now. The length of time you were in the Bank of Ireland, uh, it was a great time of change in that decade of the 1980s. It was. Into the 90s. So talk to me about the changes in that length of time you saw. Well, I think probably the significant thing that was happening around then, apart from what was going on in the world outside, and there were various crises in the world outside, like uh, lending to... Uh, uh, South American countries, which some, a, a lot of banks had had committed themselves to, but Bank of Ireland wasn't all that badly organised in that way. It was it was fairly conservative, but in, on the domestic front, the banks were suffering hugely from the fact that their deposits were being taken away by the building societies because the building societies could afford to pay higher interest rates, and they were and they also didn't have to charge tax on interest, and we had to try and turn that around. One of the things we, uh, we did was to um, lobby to get the building societies changed so that, so that their interest would be taxable, but we didn't succeed in doing that. So we then decided we would acquire a building society, which theoretically wasn't possible, but in practice there was one building society which had equity and we acquired the equity of, of the uh, ICS Building Society and started to operate it on our own. And that provoked a certain amount of change and eventually the whole thing, the whole situation was, was altered and banks and building societies now are more or less on parity as far as tax is concerned and that sort of thing. That's Mark uh, Healy Hutchinson there, mm. Morris. Um, uh, I suppose moving from the world of high finance um, to, uh, uh, I suppose in, in the 1980s it was a particularly tough time for a lot of people, particularly working in the manufacturing sector too, because, because of those changes that Mark was speaking about there, you had this shift away from manufacturing and that affected um, quite, a, quite a lot of people mm. who were working in that sector. Now I'm from Cork and, and anybody who grew up in Cork would have heard growing up if they didn't experience it about the impact that the closure of Fords had uh, in Cork. And I know that you spoke to Paddy Hayes, uh, the, the managing director of the Ford factory in Cork. Tell me about that time um, in, the, in the 1980s when, when Fords was, was about to, to close. Yes, well, uh, Paddy went in at, at, at quite a young age and, and he worked his way up to, to the top to managing director, and he was left with the, the task of having to financially look after his workers uh, when international, Ford International decided they wanted to close down uh, Cork, the Cork um, manufacturing yes. site. So, for, so Ford were looking at their their operations internationally, and they were able to, I think it was the Ford Sierra they were making at the time, and they were yeah. able to make more cars uh, in other locations, isn't that right? Yes, and so, um, so yes, the workers knew that it wasn't going to continue, uh, but it was up to, uh, to Paddy Hayes to get the best redundancy, really, for them. Uh, and uh, you'll hear in the clip uh, how, how, how he succeeded in doing that. Yes, let's listen to that now. OK. Having to make that announcement, yeah. how, how difficult was that? The, 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 the difficulty, the, we were determined that the government wouldn't know first and the trade unions wouldn't know first but that the people in the factory would know first. And that was very difficult to do because I was over and back every month, every three or four weeks, to Ford of Europe in the lead up to it because we managed to get 20 million uh, Irish pounds, I think it was at the time, uh, approved by their US Board of Directors, which is not an easy thing to do, mm -hmm. to close the factory. 
and we kept it a secret and we were scheduled to have a meeting with the trade unions uptown. We always went to the Imperial Hotel uh, uh, for meetings on a, maybe a Tuesday or Wednesday, I don't know what day of the week it was, at five o'clock. So at three o'clock we made an announcement yeah. that uh, the line was stopped and everybody was to assemble in the, um, in the canteen. And I got up and made the announcement and we, we got quite a good applause. Not because they were all going to lose their livelihood, but because we told them first. It's remarkable, isn't it, Morris? The, yeah. um, the fact that when you have 800 workers who were going to lose their, their jobs, that many of them would applaud for the way it was handled. And I suppose it does show uh, it's a model of humanity, really, isn't it? It is. You can learn so much from, from just hearing that. Hearing the interview, the entire interview is excellent uh, with Paddy Hayes. Uh, he, he left Ford then, and he, he joined Waterford Crystal, and he was the man responsible for bringing Wedgwood to Waterford uh, at the time, to Waterford Crystal. So, yes, a, a remarkable man, a lovely man to have met, and he's now in his approaching 90s, but uh, uh, again, wanted to tell his story and to tell it the way it happened. Talk to me about education, because um, I suppose many people would say education is the cornerstone of um, the modern Ireland that we have today. And there were big changes in education from the, the 1960s mm. onwards when you had free second level education. Um, it was, uh, th there have been huge advances and huge developments in education in Ireland over the past 100 years, haven't there? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. That's one area that has changed so much. And, um, uh, Again, I was extremely lucky to find uh, people in the educational um, sector to, to talk to. Uh, one lady in particular, Nora Hawkes, uh, she's 100 this year. She was born in 1920, but her uh, determination and her, her, throughout her life to, to do the best she could for uh, education and for, for uh, teaching. She arrived in, in a place called, uh, um, in, in West Limerick, um, and Askeaton, yeah. Askeaton. And uh, so she became, uh, she was principal from 1949. So she built up her school and, um, uh, and uh, her ambition really was to, to develop uh, um, a comprehensive school uh, but she didn't like the idea of closing down all the local uh, secondary uh, rural schools. <laughs> and, and when you hear this, it's so remarkable. And, and that is a problem did. that we, we still hear about today. Let's listen to the clip now. Okay. And what, what were the obstacles that you had to face along the way? <laughs> Can you recall? Well, you know... Some years, uh, I forget what exactly the year, there was a certain civil servant called O'Connor from Kerry. He went to America himself and another fellow, and they came back with this idea of all small secondary schools were to be shut. Because now he had seen schools in America of 800. That's the kind of school we should have all wrong now. So we had meetings and meetings and meetings and principals and managers like myself called in and it was just desperate. There were so many small schools closed down then. What was the effect it had on you here at that time? He had the, because my school was going to be closed also. And I said, no way. I said, if I, I go to America and I collect money to, uh, to, to build a school myself. I said, it was, it was written on the paper, I'll, do, I'll, do, I'll build it myself. But in any case, the, the, it was, we had so many fights. It was a constant up and down, up and down to the Department of Education. They'd tell me one time I'd go up, well now, all right, Mrs. Hawks, we'll be starting at the school law on such and such a day. I'd go up the next time, 
change again now. No, you, and then the final analysis was the last time I went up and I had three of them in front of me, three civil servants. Art Callaghan was one of them, I'll never forget. He died since they said I killed him. But in any <laughs> case, in any case uh, well, now, Mrs Hawkes, I was then, uh, we have decided that you will send Yask Eaton to Palace Kenry. I nearly had a fit. She doesn't sound like a woman to be trifled with at all, uh, Maris. Exactly. Uh, she was a fighter to the end um, um, and, and, and succeeded and succeeded. Uh, she was a brilliant woman. Um, you also spoke to Des McMahon about the development of Bally Firm at Senior College. And I think this is very interesting because I suppose third level colleges had, a, um, you know, even to look at them, they, they were imposing buildings, a lot of them, with high steps and almost looked down on the students mm. who were attending them. Yeah. Valley Fermat College was different though. It was, and, and this falls under the um, architectural and engineering section, but the, uh, I must say uh, that um, uh, Catherine Meehan, uh, CEO of uh, RIAI, uh, was extremely helpful to me in this project. And so she um, nominated some of, of uh, her members from the uh, architectural uh, uh, center. So she, she put me in touch with Des McMahon and Des McMahon uh, talks passionately about designing the school and how he went about it. This is worth listening to. Well, we found this wonderful site in the middle of Ballyfermot. I in behind, a, tucked in behind a supermarket. But most importantly it was, there was an, an ad hoc pedestrian way through it that people had, people from one, a large population, I used it as a shortcut from where they lived to the town centre. And, and that was, that was accepted. And that was the, that was the key to the design. Yeah. Uh, so instead of doing a building with steps up which people would climb and be impressed with this institutional grandeur, we did it as a really low profile building with a series of entrances off the pedestrian way. So the building became almost an amorphous uh, thing. I, of what she entered uh, this pedestrian way that everybody was moving up and down anyway, or a lot of people. So it was a totally new... Uh, I'm really proud of that decision, that concept. OK. But and that concept came just from listening and talking, you know. So instead of architecture, which I'd been trained to imagine, you know, in, in, in the splendour of, of originality, in fact, it was... It was... It was more than that, wasn't it? It, it, it was it, the infrastructure. It, it was, it emerged, architecture is something which emerges from, from a human requirement. Eh? And, uh, and, and there's a form of synthesis involved. So the synthesis, of course, is assembling all the, the parts that have been analysed and then trying to create a new totality, which is what we did in Ballyfermot. That's very interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That um, I mean, talking even about the changes in um, the, the cityscape around around yeah. Dublin and around the country as well, where you have this move from um, these imposing buildings to these more functional buildings that 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 emerged. I think from particularly from the 80s onwards. Um, and I know, Morris, you spoke to Joan O'Connor as well um, about changes that took place on the Docklands and on Grafton Street. Tell me about the, the interview with Joan. Yes, uh, you talk about a century of change. Well, you know, this is it. You know, this is Dublin changing uh, and the development of the dock area where she was um, uh, in, in, she was on the board and uh, uh, her responsibilities really was looking after the architectural uh, uh, um, streetscape and, and buildings. Her, but she, when you listen to this, her interview, uh, she also talks about um, her time uh, when she developed um, 
in, in the top of Grafton Street, people might know the AIB uh, retail center. And, and that was her work, her design. And there was quite, it was quite a challenge to, 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 to manage because there were a lot of older buildings around it, so she had to, to get it to fit in. And uh, so she tells this very well. Let's hear her clip now. So, Joan, do you think in, in your time, uh, you, you know, you were instrumental in change in the city? I mean, that's... Uh, oh, in a, very, in, a, in a very modest way as an architect. Yeah. Um, the, do you know the retail bank at the end of Grafton Street? Yes. AIB. Yes. I did that. It was the first, first the new facade on Grafton Street for holes in the wall, drink links, whatever you call them. And there was a... There was a big debate with Dick Gleeson, who used to be the city planner, about the, the commercialisation of the public realm and da 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 And that was an interesting project because there was a whole lot of debate about it. And I inserted a, a contemporary facade under an old building and it's still in use, substantially unchanged. Um, the, yes, I mean, the, the Millennium Monument. I spent 10 years on the board of Docklands. That's probably where I had most influence was down, now that I'm remembering it. I was on the board of Docklands for, Dublin Docklands Development Authority for two successive periods of five years. Were you? Yeah. I see. Uh, that's why I was there. And um, I, I so they, they did most, most of their work was done by design competition. And I was influential in that with a, with a very good team from Docklands working on it as well. And that's where I made my most significant impact on the city was probably through my service on the Docklands Board in insisting on good quality buildings, commensurate with what was affordable at the time, increasing the heights down in Docklands in the, in the teeth of substantial opposition, um, and making the plan for it, refreshing the plan. That was a very interesting period of my life. That's John O'Connor there, mm -hmm. uh, Morris. Um, the next clip is from an interview with Michael Healy Hutchinson, and we yeah. heard from Mark Healy Hutchinson um, earlier, but um, uh, uh, Michael is talking about his parents uh, who were kidnapped by the IRA in 1974. Can you tell us about that? Yes, we can't forget you know, that uh, in the 1970s, the troubles in the north spread down into the south, and a lot of the Anglo-Irish uh, landowners were targeted and the, the family um, held the title um, Donamore, so he was the 8th Earl of Donamore and he and his uh, wife were kidnapped um, by the IRA and so they, they had a, a really rough time and uh, as a result um, Michael Healy Hutchinson, uh, who now holds the title. His father died very soon after that, so he inherited the property. Uh, so you can hear that. Yeah, in the yes, case. and he, he yeah. was talking to you, uh, Morris, about um, his perception of Ireland at the time and I suppose his fear about living yeah. here. Yeah, I think in, in, in this clip you will hear quite clearly uh, the reasons why uh, he decided that he wasn't going to live in Ireland. Let's hear the clip. Was that a landmark in your, in your own mind of Irishness and Irish people? No, but it made me decide that we didn't want to move to live there because we were getting about one threat a month against my children or myself. Where? In Where? Ireland. They threatened our lives yeah. regularly. And where were you living in Ireland at this day? Were you I wasn't living in Ireland. I was in Paris. But the I came to Ireland every now and again. Oh, I see. And when you were there, you got the letters. And it got to the point where the minister, I've forgotten his name now, asked me that, to try to visit Ireland without using my name. I see. Which I did for several years. And why were you... Why were you singled out or singular? I think I think because the, the people that actually kidnapped my parents got caught. Mm. And they went to jail, not for long actually, I think they got about three or four years in jail, something like that. You, you probably can look it up. Yeah. But um, the result, 
was, as far as I was concerned, that I didn't want to go back and live in a country where my children were under threat of death. Yeah. So we didn't move to Ireland when my father died. Michael Healy Hutchinson there, Morris, and a very troubling it's, relationship yeah. with Ireland, really, because of what happened to his parents. Absolutely. Um, when you listen to that, it's so powerful. Uh, and, you know, he's speaking, again, from the heart. This is the beauty about meeting people like this. You know, they, they want to open up to you and tell you their story, exactly how they feel and the way they, uh, their family felt at that time. And, uh, of course, you know, you have that difficult relationship between Ireland and Britain. That also, um, that relationship you know, it, it also moved into the area of sport and um, there was a historic shift yeah. uh, in relation to the position of the GAA, which had uh, not allowed soccer or rugby to be played in Croke Park. Um, and I suppose given what we've been learning this year um, about what happened in Croke Park uh, and remembering this year about what happened in Croke Park in 1920, a big decision was made, wasn't it, to, to, to move to a mm. position where um, the, the foreign games, as they were called, would be played again in Croke Park. Tell me about your interview with Sean Kelly, who was president of the GA at the time. Yes, uh, Sean, uh, extremely brave man, because he, he came out uh, and, and wanted to open Croke Park uh, against all opposition, huge opposition. But he stood his ground uh, and got it over the line, as he said. Uh, I have great admiration for, for Sean, another Kerry man, of course, but he, um, he's a man who, uh, who, who did, he left a legacy with, uh, with the GAA, certainly. It, it was on his watch, and he brought, uh, he, he got the ban uh, removed. Uh, and, and as he tells you in this clip, and we listen to it now, um, it really wasn't easy to do. Let, let's listen to the clip. In that time, there was great change in uh, the GA. It, it was under your, your watch when uh, the ban uh, yes. was, was, was brought to uh, uh, the media <coughs> attention and, and, and quite a lot of publicity about that. You were central at that time to what was happening. Yeah. Could you describe your, how you felt about that? I yeah, I tell you, it was interesting in this sense. Most things, especially crucial decisions that are made, aren't time limited. But this was. Because when I had to go over the GA in 2003, Lansdowne Road was going to be closed a year or two later. And if Crook Park wasn't opened, once they closed Lansdowne Road to develop it, then there was no point in opening it ever. So I said to myself, I've got to go with this and take a chance. But I didn't realise to be so hard, or I'd make so many enemies, or to be so complicated. And at the same time, I didn't realise it meant so much to people either, as it turned out. But it was a hard battle. Uh, the ex-presidents, who at that time were able to veto uh, any motion coming to Congress, if yeah. they felt it wasn't in order, uh, they vetoed the whole lot of them, uh, my first year which means that I had been saying we're going to discuss the Congress, and there I was, like a, a half fool, saying, sorry, we can't discuss it in Congress because uh, the motions are ruled out of order. And I was mad over that, and that really uh, put me in a bind. So essentially we had the Congress in Killarney in 2004, and I laid into them. I told them that I couldn't be counting on like that. They couldn't go against him on his own patch, Morris, could no. they? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great though. Uh, and it was lovely to have the opportunity to sit down with Sean and, and in, as you can see in a, a much, much more relaxed fashion, um, spoke, spoke about many things in his life. You know? uh, and then of course, um, in the area of sport, you had the Special Olympics, which came to Ireland in 2003. Um, and you interviewed Mary Davis uh, uh, in relation to, to that. Um, mm. uh, tell me how that came about, that, 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 that the, the, the project and your interview with Mary. Yes, I, um, I thought, well, I'm, I'm doing this project on a century of change. I have to talk to Mary Davis because uh, in, in the category of sport, I mean, she did so, so much 
in, in bringing uh, the Special Olympics to Ireland. Uh, and, she, you know, she was very um, much on her own uh, in, 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 in driving this. Yes, uh, because, it, because I don't think it had ever been outside of the United States prior to coming to Ireland. No, right? and, and again, when you listen to her in this clip, you know, she's talking about, you know, when they heard when she came out with the idea, you know, we should bring the Special Olympics to Ireland. They kind of laughed at her and said, Ireland, that small little country. Yes, so. and logistically, it was a massive operation um, trying to yeah. host all of the families. And I think, as she says in this clip as well, um, you know, the infrastructure wasn't, it wasn't up to scratch either. It was a mammoth task to organise such uh, an ex extraordinary event uh, because so many people to look after, uh, so many athletes and how, how do you manage them. And, uh, but it's so interesting to have um, spoken to her. I'm absolutely privileged to have had the opportunity to sit down with her and talk to her. Let's hear the clip now. Bringing uh, the uh, Special Olympics to Ireland, uh, that must have been the highlight in your life, was it? Definitely. Yeah, it was. It was. It was because, first, we weren't even sure that we could ever do something like that. And yet the, the determination and the grit and the, the courage of a couple of people, including myself, to go for it and to say, yeah, of course we could do it. You know, and remember, it had never been outside the United States before. And you go to the US and, you know, it's all held in one or two universities that are close by each other and they have mm. no infrastructure problems and they have no transport issues and um, they have lots of space, etc., and facilities. And we were here in Ireland going, oh, my goodness, you know, well, we don't have a swimming pool. That's the required uh, distance um, or the required length. Um, we're going to need all these venues to make it happen, etc. Uh, not to mention the personnel and expertise that will be required as well. So, yeah, I do think back then we were very, very brave because we started bidding for the Games in 1995. Uh, we were brave to go for it and to stick with it and keep at it until, uh, un until we were awarded the Games. And people laughed about us in the beginning. Like, I remember even Mr and Mrs Shriver going, um, you know, Ireland, that small island, even though they were very fond of it and spent a lot of time here, uh, they could never envisage having their big flagship event here in 2003. That's Mary Davis, uh, an impressive woman mm. uh, and took a brave decision. Another impressive uh, woman, and you spoke yeah. to a number of them as part of this collection, Morris, was Tony Ryan, uh, who spoke to you about setting up uh, in Dublin a hostel for homeless girls in the 1980s. Yes, now we're moving into uh, social history and um, community. And uh, yes, I mean, I had to find somebody who saw the way that homeless uh, in, in, uh, in our not too distant past, uh, how they managed, how they, what they were doing. And, and I came across um, uh, 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 Tony Ryan, and she sat with me and she told me that she was passionate about what she was doing and that she wanted to look after uh, these homeless girls. Um, and they, she um, got involved then in a hostel. And, and this was the very first in Dublin in the 1970s. Let's hear what she told you. I, I did social science because I wanted to change the world. The homeless had been just set up. It was the first organisation for homeless people first residential homeless uh, organisation for homeless young girls. Uh, Peter McFerry had set up something for boys and Fergal set up for the... Okay. On, on with the uh, they were a lay organisation, the Homeless Girls Society, completely voluntary. And I was about the second staff employed there. 
Um, and and was it was it well supported? And <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when I look at when I look at that now, to the difference, uh, we, we, at one stage I can honestly say we had three workers working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with 40 girls at one stage. I mean, it was absolutely mad, but it was fabulous as well. We had a great um, amount of volunteers, you know. I mean, mainly, you know, we had the, the young priests from, or the student priests from Kimmage who came in uh, regularly, and we had agricultural students who came in. Um, so, like, we had, a, and we we had a lot of kind of uh, young religious, you know, who would do two or three months, you know, in in the hostel. Okay. Uh, that's Tony Ryan there, Maris. Um, yeah. Uh, let's talk now about your, your interview with Mary Lillis. Um, and she talked to you about um, caring for girls in Clare Care and Social Services Council in County Clare. And I suppose, mm. you know, there have been many social taboos that have been, that have been you know, blown apart over the last, particularly over the last 20, 30 years, um, including pregnancy outside of marriage. Um, but that was a very big issue, uh, especially, you know, pre-1990s, wasn't it? It was indeed. And again, another area of change in Ireland, you know, where, uh, again, we seem to have been very much uh, um, controlled by, uh, by the way uh, the church worked at the time. But Mary Lillis, uh, who, who was uh, a Mercy sister, and still is a Mercy sister, was at the time uh, so involved in, 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 home, in the um, local community in Ennis in County Clare. And so her um, area, her task was looking after um, uh, children who needed um, a home who were um, born out of wedlock. And uh, it was a very uh, emotional, very strong, st emotional for her because she felt, it, uh, she felt the pain as, as, she, as she told me her story. But um, again, she spoke from the heart and she said, she told it the way it was. And it's so, such a, a powerful um, story she told me. Let's hear what she had to say. Did the parents not have a say in their daughter as to, you know, I look after that child or... The did, did you whole experience thing that? of the parents was th the things that have changed that are wonderful. I remember, I'll just give you some examples. I remember te one girl was so terrified she couldn't tell her parents, her mother, that she was pregnant. So she asked me, would I tell her mother? So I wrote a letter to the mother People didn't have phones or anything, like many people didn't have phones at home. I asked, so I, I met her mother anyway, and I told her that I had news that would upset her. And she said to me, and remember, this was the day when you got a cancer diagnosis, you didn't survive. She said, I would prefer if you told me she had cancer. So the stigma was, it's very hard for us now because we're in 2020 to realise just how stigmatising it was, how shameful it was for someone in the family to, to get pregnant and not to be married, because fortunately we have moved on hugely. So there were birth mothers, mothers who did not tell their husbands because there was a really even division of or an uneven division of labour, well, maybe even in one sense. The father was the provider, the mother was responsible for childcare. So if your daughter got pregnant, it was you as a mother had failed, done something wrong. So women were afraid to tell their husbands. When you hear those stories, Morris, you can get a sense, I suppose, of how progressive the country has uh, become to move away from things like that, where such secrets were kept. Yes, we can talk about things. We, in in those days, everything was so so kept quiet and kept uh, uh, away um, from uh, letting. You know, there was such a a, a need, <laughs> I suppose, uh, to 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 make sure that your your neighbours didn't hear 
that your daughter was pregnant outside of, of, of wedlock. It, it must have been a, a mad world to live in. Um, so um, I, I was delighted to have met Mary Lillis. She directed me to a lot of other people. And so I'm, I'm very grateful for her help and that interview. I know you'll be focusing in part three of this collection, which you'll, you'll start the recordings uh, yeah. in, in the new year, and you'll be focusing uh, a lot on the arts uh, and on the, 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 the work that is being done in the arts and has been done. But tell me about your interview with Ross Hubbard, uh, who's a, a, a casting director who worked on some very well-known commercials. Yes. Um, I, I knew uh, John and Ross Hubbard for many, many years, and Ross was um, uh, a charming, uh, lovely person, and um, uh, her years and years that she, uh, that she gave to casting uh, for films and for uh, commercials uh, was huge, uh, and so a lot of people would, would know of uh, John and, and Ross Hubbard. Um, but her, um, her story was excellent and, and uh, I could keep talking about her forever. You know, yeah, she's yeah. such a nice woman. L let's hear um, the, the clip now because uh, she talks about, I suppose, some very well-known uh, commercials that she was involved in. I started as a commercials casting director in England and I did extremely well. And that's when commercials were great yeah. and great fun and lovely people working in them, funny people. And my proudest ones are things like um, that, because you say, well, Ronald McDonald is an Irishman, you know, yeah, and he's coming in, hi, kids, yeah. and dance and whatever. Yeah. And um, uh, things like uh, Sally O'Brien and the way she'd look at you as a Jewish girl from D London. Love <laughs> she's still around. She's beautiful still, but she's older. And um, Toshi the Chok is mine. And that was another Jewish guy. How like the Jews we are here, who... His name was Jack Haig, I think, and he didn't have his teeth. And in those days, they didn't get the ones pushed in. So he was able to take his teeth out and do the ad, say, Tashi the child, when they're coming in with Guinness. And I was in Galway Festival, about, we, we do it every year, um, the film festival, and I went to the boathouse, which is a very famous drinking spot. You go there after the films and you meet everybody. And the man behind the counter said, I saw him selling T-shirts with Toshi the Chucked written on them. And I said, God, I, I cast that commercial. He said, you what? I was nearly crowned Queen of Galway immediately. And he gave me one for a present. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and also we went on to the Levi's. Oh, no. Then John broke his kneecap playing football for his old school. And he... While he was at home, he admitted that he no longer loved being in advertising and he really wanted to be around actors more. There we go, so, Morris. So Ronald McDonald was Irish and Sally O'Brien was Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> there, there you go. Did you ever think? <laughs> exactly. Well, there are things we've learned uh, mm. today anyway. Mm. And that does bring us to the end of our selection of clips uh, from the collection. And there are many, many more and indeed full interviews are all in the collection. Um, was there a moment, Morris, that stood out for you out of all the interviews that you did? I know that's a di difficult question oh, yeah. to put I to I mean, you. they all have such merit and, and all the interviews are uh, of great um, quality and, and content. Um, I, I would, that's a very hard question because all, all the interviews are so, um, so interesting. I think, Instead of answering you that question, I'd like to tell you that all these stories are like a tapestry. They, they all mean something. And you bring them all together, and they show you exactly the way we were in, as, as, as time uh, in, in, in the 20th century just moved, moved on towards the end of the decade. And um, uh, it, it's, it's a great collection. And I'm so, myself and Jane, um, who is uh, my partner in this um, Irish life and lore. And so the two of us um, are passionate about archiving and um, collecting oral history. 
Well, the collection is uh, an amazing collection. When it's completed, uh, there'll be over 300 interviews for people to listen back to. And uh, parts one and two are available at the moment on irishlifeandlore.com and also available through the, the public libraries. Uh, Morris O'Keefe from Irish Life and Lore, thank you very much indeed for talking to me today. And Justin McCarty, thank you so much for launching this collection. Thank you.